<laughs> Pastor, thank Good you very you. much. Thank you. All right, Mayor, you want to take a seat? Sure. We're going to have a fun time tonight and a, a little bit of a conversation. And by the way, you can be thinking of some questions because the mayor has agreed to do a little live Q&A this evening. And uh, so, but before we get things started, let me ask something that I know everybody is wondering. Uh, we, we followed your story and everything that you've gone through. So the question then is, how are you? How is Rudy Giuliani? <laughs> how's Rudy doing? I'm doing fine. I'm doing absolutely fine, the same as I always do. I've, I've been involved in, uh, I don't know what you would call them, battles, contention, struggles, all my life, most of my life it seems. Uh, I love it because I follow what I think is the right thing to do. And if I succeed, I feel very happy. If I don't, at least I feel proud that I tried. And this may be the most important battle that I've been involved in. Because I truly believe that our country is lost right now. I, I don't think we have to stop it from being lost. I think it is we pa lost. We passed that point in 2020. And I heard you talking about co communism. And um, I also am a student of communism, because I go way back to the Cold War. And uh, they have succeeded in uh, accomplishing a good deal of what they wanted to accomplish, to take God out of our country, yeah, yeah. rip them out, and now to take parents out of our country. Uh, Stalin, Hitler, Karl Marx had in common the following thought. You got to get the kids at two years old away from the parents because there are two things that can really destroy communism. A belief yeah. in a superior being, God, because we're the superior being. Actually, at times, Karl Marx thought he was Satan. He, he did. He had delusions thinking he was Satan. And the second thing are parents because parents will have the best interest of their children at heart, mo most of them, the vast majority, and that'll override everything. Well, they no, nothing can override the state. We can use the word communism, but it means a very large central government that takes away your rights so that the people in the government become the aristocracy and the kings. And if you look at any communist country, the people who run the communist country are wealthy, as any capitalist country ever. They're billionaires and millionaires, and all the other people just work for them. So communism is just a, uh, a manipulation for power and greed for certain people. And look at what they're trying to do with our children. Look, I mean, if they haven't done it already in many of the public schools, certainly in the public schools in my city. So we have to win, and there are many other areas we can talk about. Sure. But we have to take it back now. And I told President Trump this uh, just a week ago uh, about the border. I said, uh, as far as closing down the border, y you can do it in, a, in less than a month. We can stop all this in less than a month. We can stop it permanently in three months. Problem is going to be, what do we do with the six, eight, 10, 12 million illegal aliens that are in this country, and we haven't the foggiest idea who they are. They could be the nicest people in the world, doesn't look that way, or they could be the biggest criminals that ever existed. Well, a lot of them are that. Yeah. And uh, getting rid of them is going to be, they're going to take, it's going to take a Donald Trump and, and the help of God. Yeah. So there's a lot of work ahead. And that's why we have to stay united. And no matter what they do to me, I'm just going to keep doing that work and uh, believe that God's going to make it all right. Amen. Amen. He's going to. He's yep. going to. And, uh, you know, I am convinced God is not mocked. And uh, <laughs> what these people have sown, they will also reap. And uh, the very gallows that they're trying to hang you and President Trump, and uh, General Flynn on, I believe, will be the very gallows that they themselves will hang from one day. And so <laughs> with, with that, we, we can talk about the now and we can talk about uh, the future, but let's go back in the past for just, just a sure. moment. And um, the first time you and I met, 
I was running for office, and you flew into Oklahoma City and uh, came down. We did a rally together, and I remember the drive from Oklahoma City down to Tulsa. It's like an hour and a half drive, and I got to listen to you share stories about your days in taking down the mafia of New York City. <laughs> and so I got an hour and a half history lesson on the mob, and I was blown away. And so a lot of people are familiar with your role in that, but tell us, I mean, how did that happen? Because that seems like, I mean, we're talking about the giants that we face today, right? Well, then that was a giant that I don't think anybody thought was actually ever going to fall down. And here was, at the time, attorney Rudy Giuliani, and you literally took down the mob. How, how did that all come about? It's a combination of an, uh, a lot of things coming together. Uh, first of all, the racketeering statute that was passed 10 years earlier for the purpose of taking down the mafia, and, um, and, but was never used. And no one really understood it. I had the benefit of knowing very well the person who drafted it for the Congress, Robert Blakey, who was a law professor at Cornell. So I understood the theory behind it. The theory behind it was not just to put them in prison, but take their businesses away from them. Yeah. Because what they had become is much more dang dangerous than just an organized crime group. They'd become an organized crime group with what I call tentacles into legitimate society. They controlled Las Vegas. They controlled the Teamsters Union. They controlled the Teamsters Union Pension Fund, which is one of the largest in the world. Now we're talking about a multinational power. The, in New York, they control the fish market, private sanitation, uh, <laughs> the Democratic Party. Uh, <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, Carmine DeSapio, the leader of the leader of the Democratic Party all through the Kennedy years and the Johnson years was, uh, if not a member, definitely associated and clearly bossed by the mafia. Uh, so I was the Associate Attorney General of the United States, appointed by Ronald Reagan, the only president I ever worked for, uh, a man I hero worship. And, uh, I had, been the US, I had been a U.S. attorney, assistant U.S. attorney in the Southern District of New York. The job opened up. I asked if I could have it because I knew I could take that statute and I could crush the five families in New York by using it. But I needed one thing. And it happened that I was very close to the head of the FBI, uh, Judge Webster, who was a real head of the FBI. And we did have an FBI then, a real one, yeah. not a uh, imitation uh, every time I see this gentleman who was on television just a little while ago, who's the head of the FBI, I can't tell you the feelings that I get. Because I was, I was a junior FBI agent when I was seven years old. <laughs> and then I was selected as, uh, I was given an award by the FBI for my lifetime service to them in bringing their most important cases. And now I get to the point where they raid my apartment and my law office and are trying to put me in prison for the rest of my life. <laughs> and they should be in prison for the rest of their <laughs> life. No, I mean, seriously. So I went to see Judge Webster and the Attorney General, and I said, I showed him exactly how I could do it. I spent three months planning it, what I needed. And I said to Judge Webster, I need, I just need 15 more FBI agents. Now, I, I already had an office of 200 lawyers and 400 FBI agents and anybody I wanted from the police department. I need 15. He said, well, why just 15? Well, I don't want them from your criminal division. I want them from your intelligence division, the people who spy on the, on the communists, because they're the best burglars in America. <laughs> they know how to break in. <laughs> they know how to get into sewers. They know how to tap any phone. Uh, on, your criminal guys can't, they don't know how to do that. Your, your burglar guys have been doing all their lives and they've wired just about every phone on the west side of Manhattan because we, <laughs> we were filled with communists, filled with communists. So I got my 15 and we broke into uh, Fat Tony Salerno. Is that a nice name, Fat Tony <laughs> Salerno? <laughs> Fat Tony ran a, uh, 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 ran a social club on Pleasant Avenue in East Harlem, uh, which used to be in a, uh, an Italian neighborhood. It had stopped being an Italian neighborhood 
but he kept his mafia group there. He, that was the Genovese crime family. And we broke into, uh, we broke into uh, a Jaguar, one of their uh, offices and homes. But the best one that we did was there was a, 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 a particular guy who was selected to judge all of the disputes so that they wouldn't kill each other as much. Matty the Horse Ionello. Matty is known as Matty the Horse because he used to control their horse betting. And by the way, uh, Fat Tony Salerno, who you might demean because he owned Floyd Patterson, the heavyweight champion of the world, and Sonny Liston, and is alleged to be the person to have fixed the Sonny Liston Cassius Clay fight, which goes way back. Uh, so these are, these are like important people. Uh, they did uh, evil, important things. <laughs> Matty the horse, everybody trusted. And we got into his office. He, got a, he had a beautiful office. He looked like, you know, the head of a major Wall Street law firm. And it was all set out a little bit like a court. And every Tuesday night, the uh, carting uh, industry owners... Now, the carting industry in the metropolitan area is a billion-dollar industry. Think of what they are carting. They are carting dangerous waste, hospitals, 90-story uh, buildings, uh, the most compl complex things, plus just regular garbage. Uh, the mafia controlled it, meaning you couldn't have a route unless they gave it to you and you paid them. They used to fight over it all the time because all the families had a piece of it. There were five of them, and they'd kill each other over it. And they decided this was counterproductive, to kill each other, <laughs> which is kind of better than we're doing, right? <laughs> so they set up this uh, thing. They all trusted Matty, because Matty was never involved in it. He was a horse player. So Matty set up like a little court. But we got in, and we didn't just wire it for sound. In this particular case, we had a whole weekend there, and we made it into a television studio. <laughs> <laughs> we could see every darn thing he was doing. So I had these wonderful tapes, and these two guys would walk in. So one guy would walk, they, they'd both sit down and be on either side. So it'd be, let's say, uh, the Lucchese family and the Genovese family. There, there were five families, those are two of them, two of the most vicious and powerful, almost equally powerful. So if they'd gone to war with each other, wow. So the guy from the Genovese family, which uh, was largely in Brooklyn and Queens, would say, um, hey, you see that guy over there who I brought here, Rocco? Rocco took my five routes, just came in and took my routes. I was making five grand a week on those and kicking in two grand to you guys. Uh, I want those routes back or I'm going to whack them. <laughs> and Rocco would get up and say, wait a second. I only did that because he took six routes from me up in the Bronx. <laughs> Maddie, this guy is lying. You should take him out. Maddie would say, hey, hey, settle down. Sit down before I take both of you out. <laughs> okay, here's what we're going to do. Show me the papers. So then they'd have like a, probably a lawyer, because they had the real, some lawyer come up here with real papers and would show the value of the routes. <laughs> The value of the routes, Matty he put his glasses on. He's like a little fat guy. He put his glasses on. <laughs> okay. You see the tree routes in uh, northern Brooklyn? You keep those. The other two, you get back to him. But now you owe him four routes from the Bronx. <laughs> so you've got to give him the four routes, the four routes from the Bronx. Uh, uh, but, but, uh, shut up. <laughs> shut up. You always had a big mouth, Rocco. Shut up. You know what can happen? You got a big mouth in our organization. And they go away and they'd fix it. We had it all on tape. <laughs> we had a year of it on tape. Him settling these disputes. Every once in a while, they are going out there yelling and screaming, I'm going to kill you. And then the body would show up four weeks later. We had a tape of them doing everything. So I would listen to these tapes every night to get them transcribed and to also make sure you have, to, uh, you have to minimize when you uh, tape legally, not like uh, Comey and uh, the creep that's there now. 
they don't minimize at all. Minimize means Fat Tony. Fat Tony, Fat Tony was head of the Genovese family. He was brought out of retirement because when Vito Genovese died, the only person who could take over was Chin Gigante. Chin Gigante pretended to be insane as his defense if he ever got arrested. So every once in a while, he lived in Greenwich Village. He would walk around Greenwich Village to be photographed by the press in uh, his pajamas <laughs> or in his uh, uh, robe. This is absolutely true. I mean, you could see these pictures if you want. He would walk around looking like that. Uh, at one time when I was irritating, I said, isn't that demeaning for a mafia boss to do that? I mean, you're so scared of prison, you walk around like a little old lady. <laughs> Surprised he didn't kill me, right? Um, so they didn't want Shin to be head of the family. Of course, even though he would pretend to be crazy, uh, he was diagnosed in the, in the military as a serious, uh, uh, what do you call him, schizophrenic. <laughs> he, was, he had actual disease. I mean, he really was. Wow. So like he really was crazy, but he, he would make sure there was evidence of it. And he loved to kill people. There are guys that like to kill people and guys that don't. And they stay away from it. Like if they have to do a killing, they'll give it to somebody else and they don't even want to know about it. Then there were guys like Gotti that wanted to be present to watch it. To make, well, just in case it doesn't go right, he'll put three more bullets in the guy. So, so the reality is that Tony was brought back out of retirement from Florida because they didn't want the crazy guy to take over the family. His wife, Margaret, who they never wanted him to marry because she was half Italian and half Irish. So they didn't trust the Irish half. And they were right because she never liked them. Because I used to hear the phone calls. <laughs> and <laughs> until I had to cut them off. So Fat Tony came back and they made him a deal. He only had to work four days a week. This is absolutely serious. He only had to work four days a week and they bought him a big mansion up in Rhinebeck, New York with horses and his whole family could use the mansion. And the deal was he'd, he'd leave every Thursday before traffic and come back on Monday morning. And that, 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 then that would be his only working hours. And starting on Thursday morning, uh, invariably, Margaret would start calling. Are you on the road yet, Tony? Are you on the road yet, Tony? Uh, have you taken your pills? All this, the stuff people... Now, you have to cut those phone calls off after a while. So if I'm, if I'm taping you for a crime, I can take the conversations with the people who are involved in the crime with you, but if you're calling your doctor, boom, I gotta cut it right off. Or if, if it's a normal call from your wife about your kids, I gotta cut it off. If I don't cut it off, the judge can throw out the entire tape, and I just wasted two million dollars doing the whole thing. And it's happened, when we were honest. And this is the way we, this, we gave the mafia people the benefit of this, not, not Donald Trump, <laughs> or me. I was, my, uh, my iCloud account, was taken by the FBI for three straight years, spied on by them constantly. And you know the first day they took it? The day I became Donald Trump's lawyer. You know when they gave it back, when they stopped taking it? The day I stopped being his lawyer. So what were they looking for? They were spying on, on his lawyer. I mean, that's disgraceful. They're absolutely disgraceful. So I have great stories about them. And the thing that motivated me really was the same thing that motivates me now. A lot of people think I was motivated because I'm Italian-American. Well, it had something to do with it. I mean, I felt, I felt like he'd get away with things that other people couldn't get away with because I was. Like, for example, I used the word mafia back in the 1980s. The well, first time I did it, I got a letter from one of the lawyers saying that uh, they're going to write to the Justice Department to discipline me because I'm not allowed to use that word that there's a rule in the Justice Department that you can't use that word. I said, that's ridiculous. I, I, I was a third ranking official in the Justice Department. If there was a rule that you can't use the word mafia, I would know it. If there was a rule, it was put in by John Mitchell, the Attorney General who went to jail, at the request of Mario Biaggi, a congressman from New York, who was alleged to have killed two people while he was a cop, earned a fortune from the uh, mafia, and then became a United States Congressman who I eventually put in prison. <laughs> uh, but there was a rule. It said you couldn't say mafia. So I was the same person I am now. 
I said, screw them, I don't agree with the rule, fire me. <laughs> I'd love to be fired over using the word mafia. Of course, the attorney general was like my second father because I worked for him for three years. The deputy attorney general was one of my closest friends. So actually, this was not a courageous dare. It was like I knew I was on solid ground here. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always had this, uh, I don't know, it sound, it's hard to say it because a lot of people don't believe, just don't believe I have a sense of justice. Yeah. I felt like, uh, look, uh, I can't build a house and I can't, can't do what the pastor does. And I'd, love, I'd love to be able to bring people closer to God and I'm not gifted that way. But this is my gift. I'm a great investigator and I'm a great lawyer. I've, I've, I've every... Um, <laughs> I've no, I, I mean, I, as a defense lawyer, I lost a few cases. I won most, but I won every case as a prosecutor. Fifty. Uh, in a courtroom, in a courtroom as a prosecutor, I feel invincible, which is why I want to prosecute Biden. <laughs> <laughs> now, we, we know you were a tremendous prosecutor, but an incredible mayor as well. Yeah. So when you got elected, you cleaned up the streets of New York City. Right. And, you know, I went to New York recently, and I would say oh. the streets need cleaned up again breaks, in New York City. Breaks my heart. How did you do it then, and how okay. can it be done now? Sure. So uh, about two months ago, three months ago, a man comes up to me, and I never know when a man comes up to me, am I getting, you know, one of these, uh, one of these uh, Trump derangement syndrome nut jobs, or am I getting a nice person, average person, or maybe one of our over-enthusiastic MAGA people who wants to hug me, <laughs> kiss me, and, uh, you know, try to find my hair and ruffle it around. <laughs> I mean, we got some people, that are, they're wonderful people, they're just a little over-enthusiastic. <laughs> So this guy comes up to me. I couldn't tell from the expression on his face. And he said, he looks at me and he says, how does it feel to have had all your work here destroyed? And I thought he was being nasty. And then I saw a little cheer in his eye. <laughs> and I grabbed him. We started crying together. <laughs> They're right. I mean, you've got to be honest. Yeah. They have destroyed. I mean, I worked like an animal. <laughs> to clean up my city. I love New York. I love, like you love wherever you come from, like Dr. Maria, my partner, is in love with New Hampshire. If you... Yes, I am. <laughs> Don't say, just say all good things about New Hampshire. Uh, now, they just had a wonderful eclipse, by the way. But uh, I love the city. I was elected. Uh, First Republican, gosh almighty, since Lindsey. Lindsey turned and became a Democrat. So he isn't a real, I mean, he's like the, some of them we have now, right? <laughs> um, except he was better. Um, he's really the first Republican since LaGuardia that goes back to the war. Only the third elected in the 20th century. And only uh, <laughs> two st remain Republican. So you get an idea of how Democrat my city is. New York City didn't vote for Abraham Lincoln. I always feel strange that I won a city that Abraham Lincoln couldn't win. <laughs> because he was a Republican. We, we've hated Republicans since wow. before there was even a Republican Party. I mean, they hate Republicans. It's like a, a, a sickness. I have uh, people coming up to me. You know, I'm 79, going to be 80. But I don't think of myself as 80. I have old people coming up to me who are probably younger than me, right? and, they, and they grab me and they hug me and they say, you were the first and only Republican I ever voted for. I said, how could that be? Nine, 80 years, 90 years, you couldn't find one stupid Republican to vote for. <laughs> but my city is crazy de Democrat. As a result of it, it it's, it's permanently corrupt. Yeah, yeah. The Democrat machine corruption goes back to the 1850s, and it's never really stopped. They all do the same things. So w when you see these judges uh, now in the Trump case, right? To me, they're two crooks. Yeah. Yeah. Two political crooks. Angamoron, that's what I call them. Angamoron. 
the one who has the law clerk on his lap, you know, right next to him on his lap. He, uh, he's been elected three times. Oh, wow. Democrat elected, democratically, small d elected. He never had an opponent. That's the way Stalin got in. He never had an opponent because the Democrats rigged it so he'd never have an opponent. I walked in to vote for judges this year in Manhattan, five judges on the ballot. All Democrats, no, nobody else of any kind, liberal, conservative, communist, socialist, <laughs> nothing, just the five Democrats. And I'm picking the judge? No, no, no. The county leader of the Democratic Party is picking the judge, um, who have a history of being in, in incredibly corrupt, making you pay for the judgeship, and knowing they own you. So if they uh, tell you they want you to do something in a case, you got to do it or you're never going to get promoted, reappointed, renominated, and they're going to make your job miserable because the chief judge is going to probably, you know, move you to uh, the courtroom in the sewer and give you all the worst cases. So they own you. you. You know when you take the job, they own you. You give them that. Even if you're a relatively honest person, you, you're 75% honest and 25% they own you, which to me is a crook. Uh, so these guys are, are political hacks. Engel Moron is a, well, you, can, you look at him, he looks like a jerk, doesn't he? <laughs> <laughs> and you know why that girl is there? The, 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 that law clerk is there? That law clerk is there to make sure he doesn't screw the Democratic Party. She's a complete operative of the Democrat Party. You think she's his law clerk? Uh -uh. She has uh, carried petitions in nine elections this year. She ran herself. Uh, she's donated to 13 different Democratic clubs. And when she stops there, the first thing she does is go to the Manhattan uh, Democratic Club and report on what he did that day. She is like the party, uh, what do they call them, the communists in Russia? It's called like the party agent. Every place had a main party agent, like a big factory or a big business. Or if you read the book, uh, The Hunt for the Red October, by Clancy, you might remember that the first thing the admiral who was going to defect had to do, he had to kill the party agent and stuff him in a hole somewhere because the party agent really ran the ship, not the admiral, because the party really ran the ship. Well, this, th that's why she's there. She's the party agent, and she's running the case against Trump, which is why Jerky makes Mar-a-Lago an $18 million value. So the day he did that, my, my uh, assistant Ted and I were in Palm Beach. We got in the car, we took out our photographic equipment, we got out some of the listings and we played real estate agent, looking for comparable values. <laughs> we found, a, uh, we found a, a mansion in the middle of Palm Beach, no access to either sh shore, Mar-a-Lago has both, only place on on the island that has access to both the ocean and the intracoastal. It's got um, eight buildings. It's profit making. Uh, I don't know how many people, you could, you could put 300 people in there. This place was a six bedroom mansion in the middle of the island, no access, beautiful house, I'd love it. You know what they're asking for? 50 million. Morocco is worth 20 times that. <laughs> it's worth 20 times that. And when he said it was worth $18 million, I went to Trump and I said, I'll buy it for 20. I don't have any money, but I'll borrow it. <laughs> <laughs> he looked at me and he said, well, yeah, uh, uh, Rudy, you're the only one I probably do that for, but uh, uh, my kids would get upset if I did that. <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's so ridiculous. Plus, the, the, he's, the guy comes up with $345 million. I'm a lawyer. To create damages, there has to be a loss. Got to be based on something, right? You, you, got hit, you got hit by a car. You broke your arm. It cost $5,000 to fix your arm. You were out of work for three weeks and you lost $20,000, whatever, right? And this, that, and the other thing. So you have uh, $30,000 in actual bills. And now you say, I also had pain and suffering, and the jury's allowed to 
multiply. If, if it multiplies it too much beyond that, it becomes irrational. But, so where's the number he starts with? Nobody lost any money. What does he start with, zero? What's a 50 times zero? zero. <laughs> Not only that, a lot of banks made money. So I contend he's got to pay Trump. <laughs> <laughs> There is no such thing as fraud if nobody took a loss. The crime exists. It's just an exercise in futility if nobody took a loss. And it's not your job as the uh, miserable attorney general to, to bring a case like this. As a, 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 and, and then to come up with that number is crazy, crazy. And to sit by and watch the judges, like even on the appellate court, when they brought it down to 140, that's based on nothing either. 100, 140 million? Ba zero times 50 is zero. So um, this is what you face in New York. This is what I faced as a, 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 a mayor. But here is the reason I was successful as the mayor. They didn't own me. Not only that, they opposed me. They didn't just oppose me, they well, nowadays, it would seem like uh, we were playing uh, ki kindergarten politics. I mean, but they brought out every nasty story they could about me. They made up stories about me. They uh, threatened me. They did everything they possibly could. And, but I won, and I won without them, and I won with them as the enemy, and therefore, I just governed the city like an honest person would. The, the New York City owns the New York City Health and Hospitals Corporation. That's 17 hospitals. We own them. 25% of the people in New York City hospital beds are in a hospital bed owned and operated by the city of New York. I think it's crazy. Wow. It began 130 years ago because of the, of the immigrants, different kind of immigrants, immigrants who wanted to work. So one of the things the city did for them because they were contributors is they built a hospital system that would take care of them for free. So a long time ago, New York City has free medical care in the hospital system. As I said, 17 hospitals. They had become horrible. And uh, they had become a, 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 a source of Democrat crooked patronage. For example, Harlem Hospital in the Bronx, middle of a black area, has three, had three times more workers than it needed. The people who hired them was not the mayor, not the head of the house, Charlie Rangel, the congressman. They were, the, co the congressman, the Democratic congressman from New York made a deal with whichever mayor, I don't know. One of the, you know, all well, the Democratic mayors except Koch were crooked. And so they'd make a deal and the congressman would say, we don't have much patronage. We got 50 people. You got 5,000. Can't you give up a few? Why don't, why don't we take the hospitals and we'll put our people in the hospitals. There, every district has a hospital just about. So this congressman control this place, this congressman. Over a period of years, one example, the hospital that I was born, not in, but two blocks from, Kings County Hospital, used to have uh, 1,200 patients in the old days. It then was downsized to eight. When I became mayor, it had 190. It had a staff of 800. I would walk in there and people would be reading the uh, racing sheet. They were taking care of empty beds. We didn't even get rid of the beds. We kept the beds around just in case. They, every single one of them was, a, was a, 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 a patronage appointment of a Democrat congressman. Well, what did I care? I fired them all. I fired 8,000. 8,000. <laughs> fired them. Uh, the congressman never talked to me. They never talked to me anyway. They never did anything for me, but they never did anything anyway. Had they done things for New York, New York wouldn't be in the condition it was in. Or, for example, Charlie Rangel in Harlem. Harlem, nobody would put a business in Harlem when I became mayor. A national business. And not even so much because of the crime, because of the corruption. It could be a shakedown. You've got to pay Charlie, you've got to pay this one, you've got to pay the mafia. Well, I cleaned up Harlem. And now a lot of national businesses are there. I reduced crime in Harlem by 70%. I reduced murder by 80%. And I brought property values up. Poof. 
And basically, they were sold out by all of the black congressmen that represented it because they didn't care about Harlem. They cared about becoming millionaires. Charlie was worth 27, 30 million. Never had an honest job in his life. He was a congressman. And uh, basically, that's the story of these hor horrible places that these poor people are consigned to uh, of the inner cities. That's the story of Chicago. That's the story of Baltimore. Uh, we put enough money as a country into the, those places, they could all be, you know, Monaco. I mean, they put a fortune in there. Never got to the people, though. The, the crooked congressman took it. You put a Republican in who doesn't play ball with them, unfortunately, you know, a third of our people play ball with them. But, what, but if you take the two-thirds that don't, you've got the freedom to just do it like you know, just do it like Jimmy Stewart would do it in uh, <laughs> Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. You just say, uh, 8,000 8, people don't have any work? We'll fire them. Or you want welfare? I did this too. You want welfare? You got to work 18 hours a week. For me. If you can't get a job, you come work for me. It's the best thing anything, anybody will ever do for you because it'll give you the work ethic. And I, I remember going to a, a school once with a bunch of kids because I also required the young people who were going to college for free, the city paying for it, and uh, also were getting welfare. I said, well, you've got you to work nine hours a week. Uh, and they said, well, that's really unfair. You know, I have to work <laughs> nine hours a week. And I, I said, well, nine, nine. a lot of people work to get themselves through college. Uh, I worked when I went to college, uh, so nine hours isn't that much. And by the way, I'm, this is about the only accountable thing you're doing, because the college you go to, they don't even give you grades. <laughs> Some of them don't even check if you show up. So I have no idea if you're actually getting an education. But what I am giving you is something, I know you're not going to appreciate this, and this is where you go back when you get older to your parents, and you say the things they used to say to you, and you used to <laughs> say, oh, will you stop saying that? Or, I said, someday you'll thank me for this. <laughs> I said, someday, someday you'll thank me for giving you the single most important thing I can give you, because you can only give certain things to people. If I can give you the work ethic, you're going to be okay in life. You, you may get by, just get by, but you'll get by. You may be successful. You could be tremendously successful, but you have to have the work ethic. If you got that, and I can give you that, uh, there's nothing better I can give you. And now every once in a while, I have somebody coming up to me, and it's the most wonderful thing. It makes it all worth it, thanking me for do doing that. Uh, they come up to me and say, you know, I remember you're saying that, and it's true. Uh, boy, I complained about it for three years, and now I have a nice business. Please, why don't you come into my restaurant? Or, wow. I mean, it's just the nicest thing. Wow. Now, something we all experienced that I think was kind of like, your mark of becoming America's mayor was 9-11. Yeah. And uh, I was listening to you today, and you were talking about people you knew uh, that were close to you that went into those towers but never came out of those towers alive. How did you handle all of what was happening from, say, an emotional standpoint, yet leading uh, not just New York City at that point, because literally all of America was, was looking to New York and to you. And, and I always admired how you led the country, you know, and, uh, and led us forward through that. What was that like? How did you bear that? And, uh, you know, how did you personally endure everything? Because you lost so many people that were in your own life. Yeah, I, I, I knew uh, from the moment I realized it was a terrorist attack that uh, the people in my city would look to me for leadership. And, um, and I knew that I have to, I'd have to contain my emotions. Because the, uh, some of the people being killed were close friends of mine. We were talking today about Ray Downey. Ray Downey actually has several medals from your governor, Governor Keating, for having led the recovery at o Oklahoma City. He was nationally the head of the search and rescue teams but his permanent job was with the New York City Police Department. He was 65, 66 years old, way beyond retirement. Three months earlier, I had given him a retirement party 
at Gracie Mansion at the request of the fire commissioner, his wife, and his son, who's a good friend of mine, to try to ease him out because <laughs> they wanted him to retire. And I said, but it's going to sound like I'm throwing him out. He's going to feel terrible. He said, no, he loves you. He'll just love having the party. So he promised me he'd retire. And uh, he put his papers in, never signed them. And the fire commissioner to this day has guilt because he says, I could have just, I could have, even when I'm signed, I could have, you know, I could have just gone through with those papers, signed or unsigned. And I didn't because I liked having Ray around. On 9-11, I think Ray Downey is the last firefighter at the site that I saw. Now, when your Oklahoma City uh, bombing took place, Ray was sent here to lead the search and rescue team. Uh, they, uh, Governor Keating admired him so much that he set up a big ceremony to give him medals here. Then he came to New York and did it. He came to the, to the party that I gave him, and then he came to his funeral, and to the funeral of the 12 New York City search and rescue people who worked here. He came to each one individu individually, which um, was an extraordinary thing to, uh, thing to do. Uh, so I lost these people that were very, very close to me. My, my, uh, uh, my assistant, who from the time I was an assistant U.S. attorney, associate attorney general, mayor. Uh, she was married for just three years to a firefighter, Captain uh, Hatton, who died on September 11. She found out she was pregnant 10 days later. Uh, so these things were happening constantly. Things where if it happened in a normal period of time, you would probably take a break and uh, talk to your wife or talk to your friends or maybe cry, and I would say to myself, no, no, no. You gotta stop, you gotta just um, go on automatic. Put it off until later, because people are looking at you, and their reaction is gonna be guided a lot by how you react. And if you react in a strong way, and in a way like they can't hurt us and they can't touch us, and we're gonna get through this, you're gonna help them. And if you, and if you react the way you wanna react, you, you're not going to be able to do it. And I remember my father telling me once, a long time ago, uh, if you're ever in a fire, uh, stay calm. Don't get all excited like everybody else, because you can't think straight if you get all excited. Like you'll miss the exits, because you'll get so excited. And, and if you, even if you're not calm, pretend you are. Because <laughs> it'll make you calm. And I, I believe it or not, I would do that. Like. Um, the afternoon of September 11, we had a press conference. And during the press conference, a reporter put up her hand, uh, Marsha Kramer, I remember who it was. And I was standing at the podium, and she said, Did you, have you listened to the recordings uh, to, uh, that, were, that uh, came to the, associate, uh, to, to the Solicitor General uh, from his wife who died on the plane that went into the Pentagon? They were slitting people's throats. And I said for a second, well, wait, 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 wait. This was a call to the who? Solicitor General. I said, you mean Ted Olson? She said, and you, you mean his wife, Barbara? She said, yes. Man, I was, I, I said, oh, oh, I gotta check on that. And I left, and I got behind Governor Pataki. I said, George, would you, would you uh, uh, take over for a minute? Because I started crying. I didn't want people to see it. Barbara Olson and Ted Olson, are some, they were in my office five days earlier when she had just, done a book, <laughs> ripping apart Hillary Clinton. <laughs> uh, and I went to the book party, and I took him to dinner. And Ted and I were bachelors together <laughs> in Washington. He was the head of the Office of Legal Counsel when I was the Associate Attorney General under Ronald Reagan. And I called Ted, I had an interrupted call, Ted, and we cried on the phone together. But that was personal. The minute it was over, <clears throat> I wasn't gonna show him that. And, uh, because, gosh, if the mayor breaks down, they're going to think, wow. Um, so I tried every time I would be hit with uh, Father Judge was my spiritual counselor. Uh, we had a very deep and a very close relationship. He was, the, uh, he was the chaplain of the fire department. He was the first body discovered. And, I, and the fire commissioner came in 
And here I am thinking, I'm about to ask him, this is about to ask the fire commissioner, Tom Van Essen, to get me Father Judge, because I need him for advice on language. And, and he says to me, Father Judge, body is being carried to forgotten the church. But the firefighters actually have him. And uh, he actually uh, uh, died before the, he, he died before the buildings came down. He was hit by some debris that came down and his body is over the body of a firefighter. And then there's somebody else on top of him. We think he was given the firefighter last rights, but we're not sure. And they're carrying his body. And I'm, when that happened, I'm thinking, wow, I'm alone. I don't know, I mean, I, I, he, was, he was my guy that I went to to help me explain death. <laughs> uh, every time we'd have a terrible, three, we lost three firefighters on Father's Day that year. And uh, Father Judge helped me and Tom Van Essen get through it, the fire commission. And we said something really, we said, I guess we faced the worst one now. And Tom and I, whenever we see each other, of course, remember that. It wasn't the worst one. It was 373. But then you also focus on the people who are worse than you. So my fire commission lost his 10 best friends. He grew up in the fire department. He, was, he wasn't just a fire commissioner, political type. He was an actual firefighter. He really knew about fires. Wow. Uh, but these were the people he grew up with. Uh, these are the people that pulled him out of a fire. These are the people he pulled out of a fire. And all of a sudden, all of them are gone. And he, as I said, Ray Downey, uh, just when we needed him, this is the biggest search and rescue mission ever, and we lost the best guy and his five top people who do it. Uh, he had to replace the entire leadership of his department. And Tom just, uh, I asked Tom, how are you doing it? And he was doing it the same way. So we reinforced each other. And he had, a, he had the greatest sense of humor too. Can I tell a joke? <laughs> yeah. About this? The White House never liked this when Bush was there. They never liked this joke. Bush liked it. They, they never liked it. So when Bush came to New York, four, three days later, you know, with that great speech, they'll hear from us, whatever. So after it's over, he goes up to me, and uh, he goes up to me and Pataghi, and he says, George, you're too big, you gotta go in your car. <laughs> he says, Mayor, you come with me. Come on, you come with me, put his arm around me. Now, following me like puppies were my three commissioners, fire, police, and emergency services. Like, and of course, they also want to see the president because they're still boys, right? So they're on me like, so before I even get in the car, one of them pushes himself in the, they think that because he invited me, they think they were invited. <laughs> and Bush can hardly get in the car. <laughs> he says, well, it's, I, yeah, you're all New Yorkers, I know. <laughs> so we're sitting in the car, we're going up the avenue First thing that happens is the people are cheering him like crazy. We love you, President Bush. We love, you're terrific. We love you. God bless America, USA. And he said, these people are terrific. So I look at him and I say, uh, Mr. President, I hate to tell you this, but none of them voted for you. <laughs> <laughs> this is the most, this, this is the craziest, wackiest, most liberal part of New York. And, and, and don't feel bad. Very few of them voted for me. They'll be over this in a few days. <laughs> so that loosened things up a little. So he looks at Tom Von Essen, who he had seen on television and had heard that he lost his best friends, 300 and whatever, we didn't even have the right number then. And he said, Tom, it must have been really ter terrible. It's got to be terrible for you. Uh, how are things going now? Tom said, well, they're going better now. My, my wife came home last night. And then we start thinking what he meant by that. My wife came home last night and it was a good night. Hmm. <laughs> I punch him in the side. <laughs> and the president said, well, you're doing better than me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I never told that story. <laughs> no, no, I never did. I kept, well, uh, I kept my we'll mouth shut. We got. Tom Von Essen put it in his book. Put it in his book. And, and Carl Rove calls me up and he says, how could he have written that? That's so embarrassing. 
I said, first of all, Carl, I didn't write it. <laughs> he did. I could have told that story three years ago. I didn't. And he's a firefighter. That's, you know, this is, they're tough guys. What, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you want me to shoot him? <laughs> no. I see the president next. The time I see the president, President I understand Carl called you to complain. He said, we thought it was funny as hell. <laughs> <laughs> you tell Tom not to worry. We thought it was the funniest thing. Now, speaking of presidents, let's bring it to today. Oh. Uh, <laughs> really? <laughs> really? Oh, my God. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try to be, I'm going to try to be care careful. So, you said something earlier today that I thought was interesting. You have all these people that are experts in politics that have actually never met Donald Trump or Joe Biden. And you made the statement, you know them both personally. I do. And yeah, a long time. So this isn't an opinion from something you see on television. 100%. Not an opinion of, that you've formulated from social media. You have known these two for quite a while. Yeah, I've known, I've known Biden, I remember, 1981. And I've known Trump uh, since about 1985. Well, so for I knew I knew him even before that because he was a New Yorker. But I got I really got friendly with him uh, because we had a mutual friend, George Steinbrenner, and I am an out of control, crazy, nutty Yankee fan. Uh, occasionally known as New York's number one Yankee fan, uh, and uh, I became very friendly with George, and uh, George is, was very close to. Donald Trump, and Donald's a big Yankee fan, and that's how we, we really became close. Okay. And then we became close because uh, he really tur turned on uh, Mayor Koch when all the corruption happened in the city. And Donald Trump, although kind of a Democrat then, he wasn't really a Democrat or a Republican, he supported who he thought was best. He was one of my first and early supporters. Okay. And he was the first really rich person who supported me. Uh, when I ran in 89 and lost, when I ran in 93 and won, when I ran in 97, and when I ran for president. Uh, and uh, I belong to his golf club. My son is an excellent golfer. Uh, he and my son developed a relationship. They play golf all the time. When I went through a divorce, there were a lot of difficult times with my children. And this is on a personal basis. Uh, he helped keep my son close to me. Uh, by talking to him and tell him, telling him I'm not what, I'm not what my ex-wife uh, said I was. Uh, and uh, I credit him with you know, keeping that relationship cl close. He didn't have to do that. Uh, he's a good man. He would contribute money uh, uh, anonymously, like Steinbrenner did. And he learned that from George. George had this Christian idea that if you get, if you get and Trump used to fight it a little, but he'd go along with it. Uh, if you get credit for it now, now you know, on, on earth, you're not going to get credit in heaven. <laughs> and so Steinbrenner wouldn't explain. Every cop that died, he, he'd put in, in those days, it was a lot. He put in $10,000 right away. Then 100000 eventually. He just put it in, uh, don't tell anybody. Now, since he died, they made it into a foundation. And uh, it's a big foundation. And then he would get uh, Trump to contribute with him. And he would tell uh, Donald, if you get credit now, you're not going to get credit later. And, uh, and I, used, I, I tried to get both of them, uh, like on September 11, I, I got them to go, go public because I said other people will imitate you. Because in New York, you know, that's how they raise money. One guy gets up and says 10000 The other one says 20000 What are you cheap? 30000 What are you cheap? I'm richer than you are. 50000 I'm richer. I said, you, let's get that started. You know, you got to do that for me. I, uh, God will be okay with it, I think. Uh, but I can't tell you how many, it would almost be some, it, the police officers and firefighters absolutely always contributed. Never asked, just sent the money in. But every once in a while he'd pick out a cause, like he'd call up my office and he was close with I mean, he, 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 didn't, he was one of the few people, like he's one of the five top real estate people in the city that makes him very important, right? He could get me on the phone if he wanted to, anytime, the mayor, they did. He'd call any of my, uh, all my uh, assistants, love him. He, he would call them. He didn't care. Oh, yeah, the mayor's busy. I know the mayor's really busy. I need this. I need that. Or get me the address of this person. I just read that they were beaten up. and blah, blah, blah. I want to send them something. But don't tell the mayor. Because the mayor likes to 
give me credit. And I used to like doing that because it would encourage other people to do it. Yes. I can't tell you how often he did that. He's just a good man. Uh, has quirks, peculiarities. And I'll tell you the other thing about him is love of country, absolutely sincere. It's deep, it's abiding, it's almost obsessional in a good way. Uh, he loves this country. And for the longest time, he thought we had terrible leadership. And he tends to be a perfectionist and very critical. Uh, sometimes I think he requires more than people can, can give, but that's good. Uh, and it breaks my heart in a way to see him ripped apart like this. So I'll tell you what did it. What did it was when they did the Russian collusion thing on him. Uh, he, he, I, was, um, I, I was in law practice and I was uh, out of government and all of a sudden they accused him of Russian collusion. I knew it was absolutely untrue because for the last six months of the campaign, until the last two weeks really, I was with him virtually every waking hour. Because my job was to be with him and to talk things out with him <laughs> and to stop him from tweeting. Oh, I did a great <laughs> job. Right? So you didn't succeed in that one. I could tell you somebody didn't do, but I better not. <laughs> but um, so I knew everything he did. And he's a very open man. I mean, he, particularly then, he hadn't been president yet. He'd be on that phone in the middle of the air airplane. He worked right in the middle of the airplane. And if, if he were dealing with the Russian, he'd say, okay, Boris, we got a deal. Boom, he'd hang up. And then he'd tell you. Because he had no idea. First of all, he didn't know when I first explained it to him that this was a crime to get dirty information. He said he, uh, politicians get it all the time. Well, the theory is if you get it from a foreigner, it's a campaign contribution. And therefore, it's a violation of federal law, which, by the way, is disputed. In other words, half the scholars think it is a crime, half think it isn't. And uh, so they were, they were pursuing him for something that is really not universally even acknowledged as a crime. But he didn't do it. <laughs> he had nothing to do with the Russians. And when he, when he first heard about it, he said, because he thought it was stupid and it was going to go right away, he said, this is, this is crazy. If Melania even th thought I'd talk to the Russians, she'd kill me. She hates the Russians. <laughs> A country used to be controlled by the Soviet Union. You, you never met anybody that hates Russians more than she does. She said, my God, don't let Melania find out. <laughs> if Melania finds out, I'm dead. <laughs> so I knew it was untrue, but I didn't realize until I started how uh, evil it was, how contrived. Yeah. I thought maybe it was, maybe he talked to some Russian and they misunderstood it or, I didn't realize Hillary Clinton paid $1.1 million to create that false story. Yeah. Now that is, a, that, that, the immensity of that is unbelievable. There's nothing that Trump is charged with, none of which I think are crimes anyway, that amounts to anything like that. I mean, it's like crazy. So she pays $1.1 million to create this story. It doesn't work to stop him from being president. Then they try to use it to unseat a lawfully elected president. Why they don't go to jail, I don't know. I mean, to me, you want to talk about insurrection? <laughs> That's an insurrection. I pay somebody to make up a false story about the president to take him out of office. And then a whole bunch of congressmen, the former president, the former vice president, all join in, all those ridiculous intelligence people, and uh, nothing happens to them. So they've been after him, they've been after him from day one. And, there's a, and then, of course, it took a while. It took a while not only to find this out, and then, as I, as I said to some of you I was talking to before, if, if you told me most of these things seven year, years ago, or I told you, I would think either one of us was crazy. This can't happen in America. Yeah. They can't. Judges can't do this. They wouldn't do this. Uh, they wouldn't cheat to that level on a, in an election. Uh, Somebody wouldn't pay $1.1 million to frame a president and get away with it. Uh, so um, now, once I realized what they were doing to him, I volunteered to represent him. That's the day they went and got my account. That's the day they started investigating me. Um, at some point along the way, I get a knock on my door at 5 in the morning. It's the FBI. 
I used to kind of run the FBI. Yeah. Uh, the former FBI agent, some of my best friends. I mean, we went through hell together. I love the FBI. Uh, they were very nice. I mean, they were all a bunch of kids. And they did treat me not, not, not they didn't do the, they didn't do what they do to the poor J6 people. Or, or how about the people that, that are getting arrested now for protesting abortion? And they sent stormtroopers to arrest them. Yeah. What are these people going to do, shoot them? I mean, it, I don't know what's happened to the FBI. I really don't. I mean, we, we usually, I, I never remember having stormtroopers in the FBI. And I arrested terrorists, not Nazis, uh, mass murderers, and, and mafia people. I never remember a guy in an arrest come, going in with machine guns. Right? I mean, they're, they're FBI agents. But they show up in my house. They didn't have any of those people. They had 10 about eight guys and two women. They searched my whole apartment. They had a search warrant for all my electronics, meaning cell phones, da -da 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 -da. So I have, a, I, I have a lot of electronics in my apartment because at this point, I was doing my podcast there. I was doing uh, a, uh, about a third of the time. I do my radio show at home, going to the studio the other two thirds of the time. So I had a lot of that electronic equipment also and then I had, have a lot of friends to come over and record there because I have access to, uh, to uh, Ethernet. And so they were taking like uh, computers that belonged to a friend of mine, uh, <laughs> a big giant old computer that belonged to my ex-wife that she must have forgotten to clean out. I was wondering what the heck's on that. And um, <laughs> so they finished, they finished the search. They line up everything on my dining room table. All, they got about, I, I think about 18 or 19 pieces. So I, I said, I can help you identify them, but just make it easier for you. So I say, well, this belongs to me. This belongs to my law, law, law partner. This belongs to so-and-so. This is mine. This belongs to my ex-wife. This, da, 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 da. We go, we get down to the very end, because I kind of moved them around, because I, want, I, I wanted to just, I said, and now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we come to the only incriminating evidence you're going to find when you go through all this. They said, what is that? I said, well, I'll, I don't know. You can take either or both. The first one is Hunter Biden's uh, hard drive. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it, and it, uh, and it, and it uh, is edited because um, we didn't want people that shouldn't to see the child pornography. And the second one has the child pornography, which your bureau has had for two years and done nothing with. Aren't you ashamed of that? And they said, oh, we, we don't want it. Now, uh, actually, they violated the search warrant. The search warrant said all electronics. Now, I had another copy in a safe, so <laughs> I didn't really care if they took it. But uh, they, they, they wouldn't take it. Wow. They wouldn't take the, uh, uh, the Hunter Biden hard drive. There's some kind of thing of the FBI protecting Biden. I'm still, I, still, I still haven't gotten to the bottom of it. I still don't know for sure what it is, but they've been doing it for a long time. Now, Biden, first time I met him, uh, my, my uh, uh, chief of staff, when I was associate attorney general, went to law school with him. And he said to me uh, one day, remember this was yesterday, I've told this story so many times, way before this all happened, he said to me, you should run, you know, if you ever run for office, uh, Rudy, you should, run in, you should run in New York. You should move to some place like Delaware. It costs nothing. You don't have to raise millions, and you can get elected no matter how stupid you are. <laughs> and I said, well, why do you say that? He said, well, this jackass who was in my law school class, Biden won. He was the dumbest guy in the class. He almost got thrown out of law school two or three times for failing. Uh, and... Um, He's now the number two guy on the Judiciary Committee. He's the nicest guy in the world. Everybody in, in law school loved him. You just didn't want to sit next to him near exams because you'd get in trouble. <laughs> so he'd be going like this. He said, but you're going to love him. He's a great guy, a very regular guy. And, uh, you know, he's, he's uh, uh, bi sort of bipartisan. He gets along with Republicans. And it wasn't that big uh, uh, barrier then. I mean, it is true that some of my best friends were Democrats then. Uh, and we'd have arguments and we'd enjoy them. I mean, we'd enjoy getting together and fighting with each other. 
Yeah, I mean it. And, it. and it was useful. Sometimes he would convince me of something, or she would, or vice versa. Not too often, but... <laughs> uh, so I go over, I meet him. I work with him on appointing 94 U.S. attorneys, 94 U.S. marshals, maybe 30 or 40 judges over the years. Uh, I work with him on the 1994 crime bill with him and Schumer. Now, that bill, that bill was authored by my Justice Department way back in 1983 when I was, well, I helped to write it. So they knew that and they needed me and Clinton wanted it passed. And it's the one that they say people went to jail forever. And, but what it did do was it reestablished the death penalty since taken away. It reestablished much stronger penalties for a lot of crimes. Uh, uh, was it misused with small drug crimes? Yeah, probably, by a lot of people. And they could easily have fixed that without touching the whole thing. And Biden was the lead in the Senate and Schumer was the lead in the House. And uh, I worked with them to get it passed because it was, uh, it was under Clinton and he needed Republican support. I supported it, the mayor of Los Angeles supported it, a number of Republicans supported it, and it finally passed. And it was a great accomplishment. It helped me reduce crime. It got me, got me, a, 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 gosh almighty, about 10,000 more uh, people for my police department uh, that I was able to use uh, both as cops and for other, other important things. And uh, it did help. It's one of the things that helped the country do what we did in New York, because the country had a big reduction in crime in the 1990s, going into uh, the 2000s. And, uh, and of course, now they disavow it. Yeah. They all disavow. Well, he disavows everything. Uh, so, and one other thing, his uh, niece worked in one of my mayor's offices for one of my assistants for four years. Very, very smart girl, very good. So I had a good relationship with him. I called him, talked to him on the phone. Always thought he was like the dumbest person I knew. <laughs> uh, didn't think he was such a nice guy after Bork. Started to see the other side of him and kind of saw him as a, a puppet politician. You know, put in front of him the latest talking point of the Democrat Party and he'll say it. Like he was a big opponent of of uh, Reagan's uh, nuclear defense, of Star Wars. Made fun of it. Never understood it. He never understood it, but he was working with an IQ that would not make it possible for him to understand. I used to explain to dumb Democrats who opposed it. I don't think I even tried with him because I knew this would be too complicated for him. I used to say to them, I don't understand why you don't get Star Wars. If a, if a missile can shoot down a jet, right? You got that, right? Missile can shoot down a jet. Why can't a missile shoot down another missile if it's faster, smarter, better? Well, of course they can. I said, well, that's Star Wars, pal. That's Iron Dome. You see all those people alive in Israel that because 95% uh, of the missiles are turned back? I mean, the, uh, uh, the Palestinians kill more of themselves than they do Israelis when they shoot off missiles because they backfire. And uh, Ronald Reagan saved all those lives. Yeah, it's good. Now, I'd like to do something tonight that I think is going to be the most special thing that we're going to do. Um, I think we all recognize the fight that Mayor Giuliani is in, the fight that President Trump is in, the fight that our nation is in. And um, we, we can talk about it, and we can complain about it, and we can uh, strategize about it. But I think one of the most important things that we can do um, is pray about it. And um, I'd like to invite you to do something with me, and that's to stand to your feet. And I'd like to pray for uh, Mayor Giuliani. And um, I, I think this is significant, and I, I think this is very special. And uh, Mayor, I want you to know that it seems like, you know, everything's coming at you, but there's a lot of people, as you can see right here, and everybody who's watching online that support you and are so grateful uh, for I'm so grateful. Thank your you. courage and your fight. And so would you all do me a favor? Would you just stretch your hands towards Mayor Giuliani and let's pray over him as he heads back into the fight. Father, we thank you for Mayor Giuliani and God, we thank you for all that you have brought him through. 
and that, Lord, we can assuredly say, uh, you have raised him up for such a time as this, and that the battles that he has fought in the past have only prepared him for the battle that he is in today and the battle that our nation faces. And God, I am confident in this. Uh, the best days of Mayor Giuliani are not behind him, but the best days are right in front of him, that you have called him into this season. And Father, I thank you that your grace rests upon him, that your favor is upon him. And I just ask that you would give him divine wisdom, that you would give him divine insight, that he would know how to navigate these uncharted waters and that he would have favor even in an unfavorable season. God, I thank you that you're bringing more and more people alongside him just as it took people to hold up the arms of Moses when the Israelites were fighting their battles. Father, I thank you. You're sending people along to hold up the arms of President Donald Trump and Mayor Rudy Giuliani and Peter Navarro, those who are being persecuted at the highest level. God, I thank you that your favor is upon him. And we declare it by faith tonight in the name that is above every single name. We declare it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. 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 Will you all thank Mayor Giuliani for coming to Tulsa, Oklahoma. He's got an early flight tomorrow morning back to New York City. Mayor, we are so grateful for you being here Thank tonight. You. Come on, let's let him know we're grateful for him coming tonight. Mayor, we're going to take you back this way. Thank you. God bless you guys. Enjoy the rest of your